Stanford University. Welcome to the seminar on people, computers, and design. I'm Terry Winograd, and um, we actually we don't plan this all, but we ended up with because it happened a couple times a quarter with sequences of talks that are on related topics. So next week we have Sudhendra Hangal, who's a, a graduate student doing his PhD here, uh, both in our group and the Mobi Social Group with Monica Lamb, uh, and who's also looking at questions of personal information. Um, how do you take uh, the, all the data that we accumulate and the, uh, that's around us and use that to, uh, data analysis and that to provide better tools for things like searching. So next week, think of it as a sort of another cut on this same problem. Dave Carger is from MIT, from uh, CSAIL, which for those of you in HCI means, you know, the part of MIT that's not the media lab. Uh, and, uh, I won't get into inter. <laughs> I, I could describe it other ways, uh, but I won't. Um, and um, a lot of you actually heard uh, recently Michael Bernstein uh, give a talk here, who's one of Dave's students, who's we hope going to be coming here. Um, I probably shouldn't say publicly, but it's, it's in the process. <laughs> um, and um, David started out working as a theoretician, a sort of core computer science guy. Uh, and then got interested in information, largely because of his own information piling up to the point where he needed to deal with it. Uh, and so he's sort of on that interesting borderline between what I would call traditional algorithmic computer science and HCI, and has brought a lot of interesting techniques to bear on managing personal information. And today he'll be talking about getting people to manage better information. Okay. Thanks, Terry. Uh, yeah, so I, actually, I got my start in algorithms right here at Stanford in Margaret Jacks Hall. And so it's always a pleasure to come back um, and, and talk about things that have nothing to do with my graduate student, uh, my graduate student career. Uh, as, as Terry said, uh, I got into uh, HCI out of self-interest. Um, I basically found out that I couldn't manage my own information and was wishing for better tools. Uh, and you can't do those tools without using HCI. Uh, now, since I don't actually know HCI, I just make sure to get good students who do and make sure that they uh, can, can rescue me from, from massive HCI blunders. Um, but uh, uh, since I was already asked uh, once, this is not a typo, a word flip in the title. This is not a talk on interfaces that entice people to manage information better. There's a talk on tools that entice people to manage better information. Uh, the goal is to get information into the computer that would not otherwise go in. Uh, and uh, this is an alternative uh, title of the talk um, from the theme that uh, why do we think that we're going to be able to build tools to handle exabytes of information when we can't even manage our, uh, our megabytes of personal information on our computers? So I think that everything that I'm, I'm going to be talking about relatively small data sets here, but I think that the lessons apply uh, a fortiori to the massive data sets that everybody's getting excited about now. Now I also know that people often have to leave early. So uh, I figure... <laughs> Uh, that we should get to the important bit, okay? Uh, yes, you can applaud now if you like. Uh, so the thesis, this is a thematic talk. It's not about a particular system, but around about a set of systems that are all, I think, um, pushing this theme. Uh, we work very hard to create tools that effectively manage information for us, and sometimes we get really caught up in that um, and forget that actually people are an important part of the information management process and are actually better at it than computers uh, in many cases. Uh, they just don't have the right tools. In fact, they're often fighting with their computers. They know what to do and the computer won't let them. Um, or uh, they can do it, but it's too hard and people don't have the time or desire. So instead of assuming that we're going to sort of have this magic computer that does everything for our passive information computers, um, we should think about how to encourage active user engagement in the information management process by identifying what it is that users need to do and what they're capable of doing, and then giving them tools that have low 
effort to use and uh, at the same time maximize the visible benefits of doing some information management. Um, so, my, so the way I see it, our current tools are incredibly constraining on on what they allow people to do. You know, people have big fancy picture in their head of some information, and we give them these interfaces that let them express very little <laughs> about what it is that they see. So now, even if we throw very powerful tools at uh, what it is that the person is doing, uh, it's no surprise if the computer interprets something entirely different about that information. So again, this is really saying if it doesn't go into the computer in the first place, there's no way the computer is going to be able to figure it out later. Um, and so we want, to we want to improve that pipeline of information uh, being channeled into the computer. So how can we give people the ability to manage more information or better information? And also, how do we make them want to, given that people are, very, are notoriously bad at knowing that something they do now at a little bit of effort will save them uh, a lot of effort uh, later on. So I'm going to work through, assuming that I uh, talk fast enough, uh, four uh, systems that we built that, are, that reflect this theme. Uh, one called Listit, whose goal is to capture these small random information scraps that don't seem to have any natural place in your computer, no application for them. Um, another tool that encourages students to discuss the lecture notes from their classes while they're reading them instead of going off to a separate discussion forum. Um, a tool that encourages people to actively share news that they're reading uh, with their friends. And finally, uh, a library that, incur that makes it easy and encourages people to author structured data and visualizations of that data on the web. Um, and each of these encourages users to author information that previously was not recorded. There were too many barriers or deterrents or not enough incentives to actually create that information. Also, you can try each one of them for yourself. These are four tools that are still working, uh, and, uh, despite the fact that they started out as research tools. Uh, and I would love for all of you to play with them and uh, give us feedback and think about new research questions that emerge from them. So I'm going to start by talking about information scraps. Uh, and this is joint work with Michael Bernstein and uh, Max Van Cleek uh, and also MC Schreifel of Southampton University. Uh, what are information scraps? Um, well, we've got all these powerful tools for managing personal information. And everybody has a computer on their desk for personal information management. And so here are a few pictures of those computers on desks. Okay. Uh, and uh, there's something interestingly common about all of these computers on the desks, right? Which is that the desks are not particularly clean. Uh, instead, they're covered with information, uh, various scraps of information that were not put into the computer. Um, and of course, if they're not put in the computer, then your tools can't manage them, uh, no matter how good those tools are. So we wanted to understand why this information wasn't going into a computer and also what we can do uh, in order to get more of that information into a computer where it can be managed. Uh, so we started with a study. Uh, was, there's a paper about this in uh, TOAS, uh, which was a long interview study with uh, 27 participants from five organizations in the MIT area. Uh, and uh, Max and Michael did these one hour long semi-structured interviews and artifact examinations. And we took a, what we would call the triangulation approach to try and dig out. You know, the problem is we're asking about information that's not on the computer. So how do we get people to tell us about the information that's not there? Uh, and so to do that, we asked people about the tools they use to manage information, the places where they need to do information management and where they put their information, and also the types of information that they tend to manage. Um, and I should say that this study was wonderfully self-validating for all of us because all of these weird information management practices that we feel embarrassed about, you know, that we're bad information managers, it turns out that everybody else is equally uh, susceptible to, to these bad information management practices. So um, here's, here's our triangulation. You know, asking about tools, we talked to people about their email program, their calendar program, their bookmarks, physical notebooks, and so forth. Um, we talked to them about locations where they might keep information, like the computer desktop or their office wall and whiteboard. And we talked about types of information, like reminders, to-dos, 
how-to guides, bookmarks, uh, contact information, notes. These were where we started by prompting uh, all of our subjects uh, about these things. And then as they told us about them, we let the interviews wander wherever we saw interesting things emerging. Um, and in doing this, we identified four main themes for what it is that prevents information from getting into a computer. Uh, the first and probably strongest is that using a computer to get that information is distracting or hard or impossible. Uh, you know, you've got this little fragment of information that you overhear in a conversation. Do you really want to launch an application, navigate through 17 layers of menus in order to record it in exactly the right spot? Um, or do you just want to write it down on a napkin or the back of your hand, right? Much easier. Um, it is much less disruptive uh, to use other tools. And this sort of draws on this notion of flow. Uh, there's a nice paper by Ben Peterson um, from Ubiquity 2004 uh, about this notion of, you know, you're doing something, right? You, using an information management tool is not what you want to do. All right? It's a means to an end. And you want to stay focused on the end. You don't want to have to be distracted to thinking about a new task of working with an information management tool. You want to concentrate on your task and uh, just flow through uh, the use of the tools that support the tasks. And interestingly enough, um, the night that I was writing this talk, um, I got this email uh, telling me all about what flow is, right? It's this runner's high, being in the moment, in the zone. Um, it's you know, a very popular uh, and important concept. Uh, this appeared in an Obama presidential campaign uh, solicitation email uh, that I received. But it was perfect timing. It was while I was in the flow of writing this talk, and here came this thing which I could paste right in. So that was great. Um, second problem that we observed um, was what we call this chimeric information. So a chimera is an animal that has the, let's see, the head of a the back of a lion and the head of an eagle or something? No, that's a griffin. Anyway, it's one of these sort of mixed animals, okay? Um, and we found that lots of the information that people want to record is mixed from the perspective of typical applications. So you might have meeting notes that contain to-dos. Um, you might have contact information that also contains a reference to the thing that you want to contact the person about. Um, your calendar event may contain contact information as well so that you remember who it is you need to get in touch with if you're going to change the appointment, uh, so on and so forth. Um, third problem, uh, beyond chimeric information, there's this rare information that doesn't fit into any application that somebody has. So uh, does anybody recognize the top left information fragment? Yeah, that's some guitar key tabs, right? I, it's, 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 it's some song. Where are you going to put that? Right, what, what's, what's the right application? Who knows? Uh, this one? Well, it's just launching. It's a tracking number for some package. Right? Um, over there we have uh, you know, the answers to, uh, to, to web riddles, which is a fun web game. So there's no application for these things. Um, and there's lots of these types. Right? There, I think there's far more types of information than there are applications. So it's natural that many of them fall outside. Um, this is our, our, our attempt to categorize all of the information that we found out about in the interviews that we had with people. Uh, and you know, we tried to mush things together, but uh, you know, decorative drawing just doesn't seem to fit with anything else, right? Um, or fantasy football lineup. Right? There just aren't, aren't broader categories that you can think of using an application for. Uh, final problem, final reason that things don't go into computers is that you want to see them at a particular place and time. And this is why you see you know, stuff on objects, is that it is information relevant to the object, and you want it to be there when you are looking at the object as a reminder or because that's the moment when you're going to need to access it. And if the computer is not the relevant object, then the computer might not be the place where you want to put the information. So those are our four uh, pieces. And these were all backed up not only from our interviews, but also from direct quotations from the, uh, from the people we interviewed. Um, a person will say, you know, if it takes more than three clicks to get it down, it's easier to email. Okay, so forget applications with complicated organizational uh, frameworks that you have to navigate. It's too much work, right? Um, uh, or, you know, I'm in meetings or run into somebody in the hall, I don't have my computer, so of course it's going to be hard to record the information. Um, schema mismatches, these chimeras, right? I wanted to assign dates to notes, but Outlook would only allow dates on tasks. Okay, so the application just doesn't let me do what seems like a perfectly natural thing that I would like to do. Uh, the fact that there's no suitable place, right? Where do I put MAC addresses? 
There, right? I don't have a MAC address application. Uh, and if it's not in my face, I'll forget about it. Uh, is there a reason for something being in view at the right time? So, that's our, that, so these are our four reasons uh, that seem to dominate everybody's explanation of why stuff is not in their computer. Uh, and so for our next step, we decided to try to build a tool to address these problems. Um, so these are the problems, and uh, here's how we decided to try and fix them. So to deal with the struggle to record, um, we decided we would, make, we would try to make sort of one key information capture. You type a key, you type your information, and you're done. And to give up on any notion of organization. So you're just jotting stuff down. Um, there's no imposed schema, uh, because people didn't like those imposed schemas. We'll just let you record stuff in plain text. Um, to reduce the entry time and the distraction, well, we're going to use a browser plugin and just a single key to activate the recording uh, of information. Um, the tool on availability, well, that's something we really can't do very much about, right? If you don't have your computer, you can't use a computer tool. But at least we would give you, we'll give you cross-computer syncing so that if you have multiple devices, you can get at the same information on all of your devices. So this led to the creation of Listit, which is an open source micro note tool for Firefox. Um, and uh, it works by a key press, which opens a sidebar. And uh, the sidebar doesn't do very much. It just does enough. It has a box at the top for node entry. It has a box in the middle for text search. And it has a list of the notes that you've entered at the bottom. And that's it. Just simple textual note capture. Um, it's been pretty successful. We've had about 50,000 downloads of the tool. And 20,000 people have signed up for synchronization accounts that move their notes between different um, applications. At this point, they've entered almost 600,000 notes uh, into the tool. And uh, 920 of them volunteered to be participants in a study that we ran last year, which is where we got the data that I'm about to show you. Um, we logged usage of this tool. And we found uh, this distribution of how long people had that sidebar open for capturing their information. And the median here was seven seconds. Okay, so how many of your applications can you launch and enter some data into in seven seconds? Okay, so they're too slow. It's too, there's too much overhead in the data capture. Uh, note length tended to be very short. The median length was four lines and 48 characters. Uh, a huge number of the most single, single lines. Here's some examples of the notes that went into this tool. Okay, um, you know, these are highly personal. Right? Most people don't understand other people's notes. They're very terse, very, very concise, but have great meaning to the users. Some of them we can understand. Right? Here's a to-do to item. Um, here we have a calendar entry, uh, presumably involving meeting somebody named SB, but I'm not sure. Um, but notice that, that calendar entry also had an address, so it was a, one of these chimeric uh, pieces of information. Um, here's some contact information. Uh, but it's not just contact information, because it's a list of people as well. Uh, a bookmark, uh, which just has a word and a, a URL. Um, and some accounting information. Okay, and lots of other random stuff. Um, oh, and here's a reference, right? How to remove an egg stain from clothing. Uh, and a recipe. Uh, so we again tried to categorize notes into types. Uh, and we found that a very large fraction of them were to-dos and also web bookmarks, which is interesting given that every web tool comes with a bookmarking facility, right? Um, but this note tool lets you write something next to your bookmark very quickly, so that's a, that's a benefit. Uh, contact information, calendar stuff, um, all things you would expect, and then an incredibly long tail of different types of information that don't fit anywhere, uh, just like our interviews uh, suggested. Um, Interesting to us was the fact that Listit, a large fraction of the things in Listit are things that belong in applications. Contact info, to-dos, web bookmarks, uh, calendar entries, meeting notes. There are applications for all of these things. Why are they in Listit? Well, we can't really say for sure, uh, but we can speculate. It's faster, it's more flexible, you can do your chimeras, you don't have to run a big complicated application to get the information in, uh, but that's all open for future research. We ran some interviews. Uh, we took an online survey of 250 respondents and uh, also did email interviews uh, uh, more intensively with 18 participants. And when we asked people why they used Listit, uh, these are the main answers we got back. Uh, speed and ease of use was the big winner. Uh, simplicity of the system. 
Um, and then some of this, you know, visibility that you don't put your information into an application and have it vanish away, but it's just in this big sidebar uh, where you'll see it. So they would pick one of six. No, so this was, sorry, we coded this afterwards. So they add up to 100%, maybe accidentally. Uh, actually, uh, hold on a second. Did we code this after or were these our answers? No, these were not our answers because we would not have put direct replacement for paper posted as an answer. Uh, I, I think this is the result of our coding and everything, you know, we, we did a coding to fit everything in. All right, um, here are some interview responses and I've highlighted some bits that I find very interesting. Um, somebody talked about using Evernote and said it was too laborious to load and work. I mean, Evernote is just a note-taking application, right? All you do is open up a page and write some notes. But it has, you know, some categorizations, some menus, some things, some organization. And I guess that was enough to say that it's too complicated, right? Um, they like list it for ease of use. I didn't have to open a new file. I didn't have to name the file. I didn't have to wonder into which directory uh, this file would end up. So we put a major cognitive load on people when we tell them you have to put your information into a rigid, complicated structure. Right? Where does it go? What's the right directory? Maybe it goes here, maybe it goes there. How do I, what do I do if it belongs in two places? If I put it in the wrong place, am I going to be able to find it when I look for it in the other place later? Right? Really, really a problem. Um, right? One of the complaints, I found this very interesting, somebody found it really frustrating that they had to open their web browser in order to use Listit. Right? And even that, right? just you know, your web browser, which, it, which is open all the time now, right? but they wanted to just be able to do one click and, and, and take a note. And w they were frustrated that they had to do two. Okay? And they like the flexibility, uh, right? information that doesn't pertain to anything in particular. And this, you know, I find this really telling, again, about sort of how we socialize people to use computers. Right? I feel silly seeing something unimportant in an organization program. I mean, what is, he, does he think the organization program is judging him? <laughs> right? I mean, it's supposed to support you, right? If you want to record it, you should be able, to, you should feel embarrassed to put it in there. Uh, right. Uh, you know, see if I want to keep, right? Th this is again, ironic. I use listed to see if I want to keep it or not. Okay, so I put it in. I keep it in order to decide if I want to keep it. So listed is getting people free of this idea that you're making a commitment by storing some information into an application, right? It becomes more lightweight. It doesn't matter so much anymore. Um, we discovered some interesting things about the types of users of Listit. Um, we created uh, what we call note lifelines, where we looked over a two-year period at people's use of the Listit tool. This was deployed in 2008, and we published this in Kai last year. Uh, so here we have uh, a Listit lifeline for a particular user. Um, the x-axis spans two years, and so does the y-axis. Uh, and the diagonal sort of reflects present time. Uh, each note is recorded at a certain time and then lives in the vertical direction for some period of time. All right, so um, we, we coded in some symbols. The details aren't important to reflect, you know, when a note gets created, when it gets edited. Um, the line lasts as long as the note is alive and then there's an X when the note is deleted. Okay. So if you see a person who's listed lifeline looks like this. What is that person doing? Every, every night they go through it and do whatever they needed to do with the item. Exactly. This is what we call a minimalist, right? Somebody who has just a note or two in their collection at any time. They take it. A day or two later, they erase it. They've done what needed to be done, uh, and, and they move on. Uh, how about this one? This is me, or <laughs> like me. Sorry, we didn't use me. I wasn't a study subject. Pack rat, exactly right, right? Somebody who is collecting stuff and never does anything with it afterwards. Okay, uh, here. Somebody who has deadlines. Somebody who has deadlines, why do you say? Because they do a lot of activity right around the deadline and then they, get, <laughs> they tidy up. Uh, well, I don't see so much sign of tidying. I see intense work on each note, right? but not too many notes, right? So th this is what we call a revisionist, somebody who takes a note and sort of keeps it for a long time, modifying it. Over so for example, maybe they have one to-do list and it's a note and uh, you know, every day they delete some things from the to-do list and add some things to the to-do list. So this is different from somebody who creates a new to-do item uh, in each note and deletes it when the thing is done. And finally, what's this? 
Spring cleaning, again, perfect naming, right? So here we have somebody who takes notes kind of continuously. And every, one, every few months, they kind of swipe through and clean up everything that's no longer relevant. Okay, So I find this stuff really fascinating, right? these four distinct usage patterns. And each of these are not made up lifelines. These are actual lifelines of four of our subjects. So we went through and coded the lifelines of all of our study participants. Um, we clustered them to identify these four archetypes, and then we coded 420 users on which archetype they best fit. Um, and we got, uh, when we did our inter-rater reliability, we got a moderate amount, right? We could do it better, it was, you know, we, it was a learning experience, and we could probably do it better if we gave ourselves better instructions on how to do the coding. Um, but this is good enough to say that there was something there. And uh, we sort of divided people up into these four categories. Um, not, not that they are in one, but how much of each category do they reflect uh, between zero and one. And uh, after we had that categorization, we went through and asked, are there measurable differences in the kinds of notes that they have and the way they interact with their note application? And we got uh, several statistically significant uh, differences. So for example, um, pack rats apparently have much longer notes than uh, other people. Um, revisers have far fewer ads per day and a uh, much smaller collection size than uh, everyone tends to. Um, the minimalists have, besides having few notes, also tend to have very short notes uh, and, and so forth. So there are some clear differences. So really we have at least four different populations using the same tool in very different ways, which raises some interesting questions about whether we should be presenting four different tools or different affordances for the four different user populations. Um, and I'm not sure because that would add to the complexity of the tool and that was one of the things that we were really trying to steer away from. You can look at some of this yourselves. Um, we put up a corpus called MISC, the MIT Information Scrap Corpus. Uh, and uh, we've been asking users to contribute their note collections to the corpus. Uh, and uh, you can download it from, uh, from this link. Uh, currently, we've got about 2,000 of these scraps. We're working on getting the other 114,000 of them, or at this point, 592,000 of them. Uh, it's hard because people don't really have any incentive to share this stuff with us, but um, we'll, we'll keep working on it because I think this can be a fascinating corpus for study. Yes? In the beginning, how did you uh, get the word out about your tool? Do you think it was like targeting a specific like, techie population or was it a more general audience? Um, so I think this was one of these usual kind of viral things with viral things plus luck, right? Some blog picked it up and then it got syndicated into the New York Times, uh, one of their tech blogs, and that caused a, a, a nice bump. And since then it's been on the Mozilla add-on site and has just been seeing sort of steady adoption um, at, at some rate. Okay. All right. So that's the end of part one. Uh, yes. Somebody picked up and this idea had done a cell phone app. Uh, well, I really needed it. Right. I don't so Listit, we're about to release a new, a, a rewrite of Listit, which is done in HTML5, which allows it to be, instead of a Firefox extension, just a plain web page. Uh, and that means you'll be able to use it on any browser and also on any browser that runs on your mobile phone. And it's actually, the, my, my undergraduate is making sure to have a version that fits nicely into There's a cell phone. I'm happy to not be able to read them on my phone. I just want to be able to hit one button. And it one actually button. doesn't. You, you'll get both. Um, this is designed to use um, web browser local storage. Uh, and so it actually keeps the stuff locally and then synchronizes to our server whenever it has the opportunity. Oh, yes. I should say, there's n there isn't that much novel about our tool. There are many, many note-taking applications out there. We just wanted one that we could study. And that's why we wrote it. Right? Otherwise, we could have just said, got, gone to Evernote or something and, asked, you know, and, and, and seen a tool much like this one. Uh, but it is nice to have an open source tool that you can study. Yes? Uh, did you get any uh, complaints that people couldn't scribble in, that they wanted to? Oh, handwriting? Yeah, no, no, not handwriting necessarily, but little, little uh, oh, uh, pictures and diagrams things. or something. Yes, we got a couple requests for that. Also, I mean, we've got a lot of five-star reviews on Firefox, yeah, but we've got, a, we've got a few one-stars from people who want categorization and folders and all these sort of sophisticated organizational uh, things, which just goes to show that you can't please everybody. 
the URL of the web page to show? Um, that, so linking them in, in that sense implicitly, like when you take a note you're on a web page, and you're on a web page, it remembers that association. And when you come back to the web page, it surfaces that note, is something that we're, my undergraduate is doing for his thesis this year. So hopefully that will be out uh, sometime soon. Okay. There's other sort of, we're, we're interested in exploring contextual usages of, of this, like figuring out which notes to surface to you at different times. All right, um, I should move on. So my goal here is to sort of tantalize you with all of these different things, and I'd love to talk to all of you about all of them uh, afterwards. Um, I'll be here for a while, and you can reach me by email, and um, I'm very excited about all, I, I use all of these tools myself every day, and so I'm very happy to talk to people about them. So, uh, next thing I want to talk about is encouraging classroom forum contribution. And this is very appropriate given Stanford's massive uh, attention to online education. Um, so, uh, there's this famous quote uh, that says that the best college is one with, you know, Mark Hopkins on one end and a student on the other. And, all, you know, everything else is just a distraction. Um, you know, one-on-one -on -one teaching is wonderful. Uh, our current model of faculty-student teaching has this scaling problem where there's one faculty and, you know, tens of thousands of students uh, at this point. Um, it's hard to assess. It's hard to answer. We don't know what they don't know. Um, and we can't teach to their individual questions. So one way to get around this is student-to-student -student teaching, peer instruction. Um, if we can get students to answer each other's questions, that does scale. Um, and so discussion forums are a natural uh, place for this. Uh, students can ask questions, and they don't have to ask them in class. They can ask them whenever they have them. And they can get answers, probably within just a few minutes, from other students who are also on the forum. Um, the forum becomes this wonderful archival Q&A record. So a student doesn't have to ask and wait for an answer the next time. They can see if somebody else asked the question and uh, see the answer already there. And you have this opportunity for the faculty, by observing the forum discussion, to understand what's confusing globally and um, figure out what needs better teaching or editing. But forums have some drawbacks. Um, and the one I want to focus on is that they're out of context. You have to interrupt. You're, at, you're, you're reading some lecture notes or something or a textbook. You have to stop what you're doing and go to the forum. And of course, once you're on the web, well, maybe you'll check Facebook. And you know, you're, you're drawn out of the flow of what it is that you're doing, which is trying to understand this lecture material. Uh, you have to hunt for the answer to your question somewhere in the forum, right? Um, you have to, dis if, you, if you can't find it, you need to ask your question. You have to take the time to explain what it is that you're asking about. You know, on page X, there was this discussion of Y, and I didn't understand Z. Um, and if that question is going to be really long, you have this deterrent effect, right? Maybe it's not that important for me to get an answer, uh, and I'll just move on. Um, also, uh, there's this challenge, like, Who's going to be motivated to go and find questions that they can answer, right? To stop what they're doing, go look through the forum, see if there's somebody that they can help out. Uh, no obvious benefit. Uh, and so we looked at the MIT forum system uh, called Stellar uh, in spring 2010. Uh, I got data from the 50 most active classes at MIT. They had a total of about 3,000 posts, uh, an average of 68 per class, uh, which is, you know, tiny. They're basically dead. Uh, now, caveats on this is that Stellar is really a bad forum system. Uh, it's what happens when, you get, when a university tries to build its own tools. Um, and its role in these classes was not known. I wasn't allowed to, to see the forums. I was only allowed to get the usage data. Um, you know, now we have something like Piazza, which came out of here and is a much better designed forum and gets much better usage even at MIT. I haven't gone through to understand you know, what are the phenomena of usage of Piazza. I think that's a really interesting research question. Um, you could look at, so in terms of getting people to the right questions, you could look at automation, um, retrieving content based on the question, doing filtering to find the right stuff, um, doing automatic classification to ease exploration. Um, these are all powerful but hard to do well. So uh, what we decided to do was to focus on the context provided by the course content and to try and keep that context during the discussion by having the forum actually live in the margins of the lecture notes. Uh, instead of somewhere, instead of in some other site. So we created NB, which is a threaded discussion forum, but happens in the document margins. It's a standard website. The faculty just uploads some PDFs, uh, invites the students. The students then have their usual discussions. Uh, they do it by highlighting a section of the text, entering a comment, and replying to existing comments as they're reading the text. So here's a picture of version one of NB. I should update it to version two. Um, this is a class on um, Approximate on approximation in the sciences. 
Um, here you have the lecture content. People have highlighted various sections and written notes about it. Um, so if a person wants to create a new note, they just drag to highlight a section of the text, and a little note box pops up, and you type in your annotation. Uh, noteworthy right away is that you get comments like, how did we get three from one? Right? That is not going to appear in a normal discussion forum, because without any context, it's meaningless. So we've made it much easier for somebody to ask their question and for somebody else who's reading the question to understand that question and, and, and be able to provide an answer. Um, and as you can see, this led to a pretty intense discussion among the students. Uh, benefits we saw were that you can discuss as you read without leaving the view of your lecture notes, and so you can stay in the flow. Uh, you can see the discussion of the thing you are reading now. You don't have to sort of read your notes and then go look through the forum and tr try to create that mental association between what you read a while ago and what you're looking at in the forum now. So the answers that can help you are right there on the page that you're looking at. Um, and the questions that others want answered are right there when you have fresh in your mind the things that will answer those questions. Your context is clear. You don't have to explain the question. Um, and also from the faculty perspective, you can look where the annotations are piling up and say, ah, that's a tricky part in the material. I should spend some extra time on that in lecture. Um, this is not a new idea. Uh, the Babylonian Talmud um, grew. Uh, initially from this primary material um, from about 2500 BC, um, uh, sorry, around 500 BC. Uh, these annotations were created around 2000 BC on that primary material. Um, then in the uh, last millennium, uh, this stuff was annotations on the annotations, and in the past couple hundred years, we got annotations on the annotations on the annotations. Uh, more locally, um, I had in mind Knuth's wonderful Concrete Mathematics book, uh, which has the marginal notes from the first students to take the course um, sitting in the margins of the published version of the book. And they're wonderful marginal notes, right? He could have taken everything that was there and incorporated it into the text when he revised the text for publication, but they're much better in the margins. They provide these alternative perspectives. You know, a student can say, oh, you may find this confusing now, but just wait till three pages from here, it'll all make sense. Uh, this is going to be important. Skip this the first read through. All this great stuff, um, plus a lot of entertainment, you know, for to, just to, to break up the monotony of reading the text. All right, so what happened when we assessed this tool? Uh, NB has now been used in about 60 classes, and about 30 of them saw substantive use um, at five universities, uh, including MIT, Harvard, uh, somewhere in Sweden, uh, Olin, and Cal State, uh, a number of different domains. Uh, many of the faculty who've used it liked it enough to repeat use of it the next time they taught a class. Um, and even the, and the one class on top did better than, the, than the, all 50 of the best MIT forum usages in terms of adoption. Um, I'm going to be focusing on that one class. Um, this best used class uh, was taught by Sanjay Mahajan, who was a lecturer at MIT and is now on the faculty at Olin. Very talented and committed teacher. And, uh, he was able to make this, make this tool do wonderful things for the students. Uh, he actually had a pre-existing requirement for students to read and comment on his lecture materials. He would hand it out on paper. They would be required to write some things in the margins and hand it back. And, um, he previously, and he did this with paper. And his requirement was that they should invest a reasonable effort. He didn't tell them exactly what they should do. He just said, write something useful in the margins of the lecture notes. So the outcome, when we gave him NB, um, he continued to require annotation. So this right away calls lots of our results into question, right? If the students are required to use it, what does it mean that they're using it? Well, we can at least say that the usage of, the, of NB doubled over the course of the term. There were twice as many uh, notes being taken by students at the end as there were at the beginning. Um, also, there were a bunch of annotations done on non-required content, so that was clearly voluntary. So what appears to be happening is that the voluntary usage is appearing after students are forced to see the benefit. But we can't say that students would voluntarily use this tool on a general basis. We saw extensive in-depth discussions. We saw about 3 quarters of the questions resolved by other students in ways that other students considered timely. Um, we looked at the content, which was about 14,000 annotations, 150 per student, uh, 310 by Sanjoy. 75% of this content was not isolated, you know, you have a typo here type stuff, but actual discussions, meaningful discussions, where students asked a question and somebody else gave an answer. Um, there were about 14 discussions on each page, and an average of three and a half posts in each discussion, 
Uh, plus, on just about every page, we saw at least one lengthy discussion. Uh, this is a distribution of the discussion lengths, uh, which follows sort of a log, uh, a log, plot, log linear scale. Um, of this content, about 25% was substantive commentary, where they were suggesting ways to make the lecture content better. Uh, and 30% was questions uh, about concepts and meaning. Uh, another 18% was answers, and most of those answers came from other students. And then there was another quarter, which was random, random fun stuff. Uh, questions resol were resolved half the time by students in the same thread, but this is something we found really interesting. 12% of the questions were resolved in a different thread. And this is something that wouldn't work at all in a forum, right? Because there's no connection between different discussion threads. Here you have the connection of the page. So you can refer to things that were happening elsewhere on the page. In terms of timing, uh, you know, one worry is that all the comments would come in right before class, right before the due date, and there would be no time to discuss them. But we actually saw a bunch of students starting to mark up the document uh, two days before class, even before the previous lecture. Uh, and then a bunch of stuff happening the day before class. And then, yes, of course, there was a spike uh, the day of class. But there was plenty of time for seeding of discussions to happen and for responses to take place. The units on that are hours? Yes, hours before class. Sorry, this is, the, this is class time. Uh, and so you can see that annotations even continued after class uh, when, they were, when there was no longer any value in doing them for requirement purposes. Participation. Uh, this is actually from a completely different class, but I found it very interesting and just wanted to throw it up uh, for, for, for consideration. Um, we, my student was a TA in one of the classes that was using NB early on, and he took notes of who spoke up in class. And then he compared that with who participated in discussion on NB. And so what we found was that the vast majority of students in the class were dead weight, uh, never participated in any way. Um, but on this graph, oh, and I should apologize to be using a 3D bar, par, bar chart in a UI class, in a UI uh, rest But like I said, I'm not actually an HCI person. So, uh, so here we have uh, at this uh, end, we have people who talked a lot in class but never posted it in annotation. And at the other end, we have a bunch of people who never said anything in class but were active participants in the discussion forum. So this highlights that you know, NB can, th th there, there's, I mean, we did the correlation test. There's no correlation between participation in class and using NB. And so NB opens a new channel for participation by students who don't like to speak up in class. So I find that very intriguing. User feedback. Uh, we spoke to the students, and uh, about 40% of them responded. Uh, most of them had a positive uh, experience using NB. Uh, what they told us. Well, that there was fantastic, substantial discussion. I never had this level of in-depth discussion before. It was cool to see other people's comments on the material. Um, they love being able to access the collective intelligence of the class, uh, sharing ideas, questions answered by classmates, collaborative learning. Right? We didn't ask them about collaborative learning, but they said they were doing collaborative learning. Um, and that it's, you know, everybody has their area of expertise, and you get this collective intelligence. Um, they also really enjoyed the measuring stick phenomenon, that they could see if other people were confused about something that they were confused about and figure out whether it mattered or you know, wh whether this was common or whether they were missing something that everybody else understood. Now, all of these quotes could equally apply if we asked somebody about their use of, say, Piazza, right? which, as I said, is, is very popular even at MIT. Is there any ev evidence that the annotation forums are better? Well. There were a bunch of NB-specific benefits. We saw some of them in the comments, like these comments that wouldn't mean anything uh, if you asked them in a regular forum. Um, and also, we saw plenty of responses that were actually synthesizing material from proximate threads. So this, this geographic organization allowed people to make references that wouldn't make any sense in a typical discussion forum. We also found that three quarters of the students never printed their notes for this class. Right? NB was the tool by which you would access the notes in order to print them. So we could actually log if they were downloading the PDFs and printing. Three quarters of them didn't. And this is very interesting because there's been decades of work saying, of course, paper is better. Right? Why would you ever use something digital if you could work with paper? Well, three quarters of the students were reading uh, in paper. And presumably, that's because they got some benefit from doing so. Uh, we logged exactly when people were making their comments. and. 
what that means is we blocked out reading sessions where you would log in, read for a while, and then, and then uh, log out. And we asked when in the interval were people replying to comments. And what we see are that these replies were happening uniformly spread out over the session. So people did not read first and then go to the quote forum to discuss. Instead, uh, all through the reading session, they were also interacting uh, within the forum. So this sort of fits with this goal of trying to keep people in the flow. And, you know, again, we, can't, we haven't proved this and it's future work, but I believe that this gave critical mass for the forum, that because you could see the questions while you were reading, it was more likely that you were going to respond to them uh, than if you had to go off and do it at some later time. And actually, we can sh contrast this with an earlier annotation system that was done by A.J. Brush and some people at Microsoft. Um, it's a very similar system, but the usage outcomes were quite different. Uh, the students all printed out their notes and annotated the paper and then came back later to their computer systems and typed in their annotations. And the result was a huge lag between uh, questions being posed and answers coming in. Right? In fact, they had to enforce a separate requirement that the, the, annotation, the questions had to be posted two days before lecture and replies had to come in before lecture in order to, in order to generate any discussions. So this just highlights how some minor deterrents, right? like the fact that you, this was an IE only uh, annotator, that it required wireless connectivity, which was not guaranteed in 2001. Uh, the web UIs were clunkier back then and perhaps students were less comfortable online. So it seems like there's really been a change. It, it, we can't asso associate this with our tool, right? We didn't make a wonderful new tool, but our tool took advantage of the fact that now people are just happier doing more stuff online. The web is easier to work with. The instructor was also very pleased. Um, he underestimated how valuable it was to have students answering each other um, and felt that they went far beyond his minimum requirement uh, in, to use the tool. He also found for the first time that he could actually get the reading memos and see them in aggregate in a way that allowed him to modify his lecture. And other faculty have reported this as well. They look for the hot spots and say, oh, this is something that needs extra discussion in lecture. So in summary of this part of the talk, um, making these small changes in the way forums, uh, in the way students make use of their forums and where and when they access them really changed, at least at MIT, the way people would make use of that forum for classroom. You got much more participation. Um, you got students uh, helping each other. Uh, you got faculty seeing what was going on um, in ways that the forums of the time did not support. Um, notice that NB is not, again, on, on this theme, NB is not doing any interesting computations. It's just making it easier for people to jot down information in a certain way. Uh, and I think that's the key to its success. Yes? So, uh, there's 74% figure that you quoted. Was that for the specific class? Yes, that was for the specific. So, all of the data that I reported to you came from this one very successful class. It wasn't a typical average class. It was this one success. But we see it as sort of an existence proof. This is what can happen with an annotation tool. And the future research is what conditions in these 60 different classes lead to greater success or failure in participation. I'm curious about uh, the speakers, or I think you call them the talkers versus the writers. Yes. And I have a feeling that talking in class has its own benefits. Oh, absolutely. And and I'm curious whether some of the writers turned into talkers after using your system. Uh, that's a very interesting question. Um, we don't have the data to answer it, I don't think. Uh, but it's, uh, it would be really interesting to gather um, in a future class. Yeah, I, I like that question. OK, part three. I can see I'm going to have to push a little faster. Um, another kind of content provision that we would like to encourage. Um, is in information sharing, information filtering. There's all this content on the web, all these RSS feeds, all this wonderful stuff. Uh, we each like to see the good stuff. Uh, and this has led to a lot of work in the machine learning community, and I've done some of it, um, on content recommendation, which looks at what you read and what you like and tries to find other stuff that's like it, and on collaborative filtering, which looks at other people who like the same stuff as you and tries to give you the stuff that they like. 
um, ways to recommend content to you in a machine learning uh, setting. Um, but there are some drawbacks to these machine learning approaches. Um, the first is the effort that somebody has to invest in training them, right? You have to read lots of junk uh, in order to train the system and tell it what you like, and you also have to read all this stuff and tell it you don't like it. Many users won't get started with that. It's too much work. And of course, there's also the quality problem, or I should say the expected utility problem. Uh, these machine learning algorithms are imperfect. Um, they're pretty good at identifying topics, but quality is much harder. And so they give you all of this stuff and tell you, I think you'll like it. And so now you have to read it. And either you like it or you don't. But if you don't like it, well, you've read it. You've just wasted a bunch of time, right? You, you've had a big loss from using this machine learning problem. And you also have to worry about what, what the machine learning algorithm missed. So we wanted to take the alternative approach of leveraging people. Um, friends have always shared information with each other, and they're often quite good at it because they know each other's particular interests. So we asked, what can we do to make more information sharing happen among friends and make it happen better? And so again, like with Listit, we started with a study. What is inhibiting people from sharing information with each other? Um, and what are the incentives for doing so? Um, and then let's build a tool in order to address those issues. So we asked people how they shared information and found that by far email is the dominant, uh, is the dominant tool for doing information sharing. We also found out that most of the people we surveyed um, like it when people share information with them. They trust that they're getting good quality content and they wish that people would send them more. Okay. Paradoxically, they all worry about sending more to other people. Okay. They want people to send them more, but they don't want to send more to other people. Why? Well, because they don't want to be spammers, right? They don't want to invade this very important email space. They're unsure whether it's relevant. They worry the person may have seen it already. Um, there also is this flow issue of having to, you know, write an email message and say, hey, you know, I think you will be interested in this, right? So, people want to use email. They're afraid of sending irrelevant content and they're afraid of spamming their friends. Um, and uh, we want to keep people in flow. Yes, Terry. Population sample because my sense is people like us use email, but people in the other world use Facebook. Uh, you mean the young people? Well, young. <laughs> yeah. Yes, um, it's quite possible. So I would say that there's a pro there's a difference between this model and Facebook of whether you are sending to a single person. Right? Facebook is the common mechanism for broadcasting and say, you know, hey, I saw this interesting thing. Hey, everybody, take a look at it. I don't know if people are using Facebook as a messaging platform to tell a single person, here's something here's that I saw. I have a whole rant about Google+, Plus, which I don't have time to talk about right now. But I was so excited when they announced it and so disappointed when I saw it because I thought they were going to fix this problem and then they didn't. But that's a separate, separate discussion. Um, how do we try and solve these problems? Well, if people want to use email, that's what we're going to let them do. Um, and so and another important thing about email is that it's everybody, every recipient has email, right? You, they may not be signed up for X or Y or Z, but um, email, they don't have to be signed up for the sharing system in order to receive content if we deliver that content by email. Um, we also want to reassure senders that the content is re relevant and that the recipients are not overloaded. And in order to support flow, we want this one-click sharing where you just say, share it with this person. And you don't have to actually compose that email message. So we wrote a, another plugin. This is, you can either use as a Grease Monkey script for Google Reader or as a plugin for Firefox, which as you're reading, posts a line of people who the system thinks might be interested in the content and allows you to click on those people in order to share it with them. Okay. Um, it provides load indicators to check that you aren't uh, spamming. Uh, and it encourages people to send back thank yous as a way to encourage more sharing of content. Breaking those down, um, the recommendations happen. Uh, there is some machine learning happening here, right? Um, where the system learns over time who you are likely to share certain content with. Um, when you see these recommendations, you just uh, click on the people you want to share it with. You can optionally add a content and you click the share button. Okay, so it's two click sharing, not one click. I was lying, but it's two click sharing. Uh, and then our server takes care of actually sending out the email message. 
Uh, they receive an email with a link to the content and the, um, uh, the, the, the headline. And very importantly, a suggestion, or sorry, I'll get, I'll get to that. Um, you'll notice there are these load indicators that may tell you somebody has already received a bunch of content today um, or that they have already received this particular content. But very importantly, you can also see somebody who hasn't received anything and feel not guilty about sending something to them. The one click thanks, when you get this email, um, you can just click on the thank you link and a thank you email gets sent back to the person who sent you the content. Um, how do we do the recommendation? Well, this is basic machine learning. We look at the content that gets forwarded to people over time and we build a profile of what they are likely to receive. Uh, and we use that profile to recommend other things that maybe they will want to receive. Um, it's a very, it's a trivial recommendation algorithm. We use what's called the Rokio Clothes Classifier, the most simple of all possible uh, recommendation systems. Um, and the claim is that it's low quality as a recommender doesn't matter because there is a low cost to mistakes. In a typical collaborative filtering setting, the mistake is that somebody who didn't want the content has to waste time reading it. In this tool, the mistake, the cost of the mistake is that there's a button there that you don't click on of a person's name that will not receive the content. Much lower cost, so mistakes don't matter anymore. How did we assess this? Well, we did a two-week study uh, where we paid people $30 to use Google Reader every day. Um, that's what we told them to do. Um, and we, we didn't tell them to use FeedMe, but FeedMe was installed, of course. And we ran a two by two study to see whether the receiver load warnings people, well, that say how much people have received matters. Um, and we also gave half of the people recommendations of recipients and half of the people just had a box where they could type an email address. Okay. So these people watched, eight, looked at 84,000 posts and shared 700 of them. There was a very significant, in the non-statistical sense, uh, increase in sharing, a uh, factor of 10 increase in how many posts got shared. Uh, unfortunately, this is meaningless from a statistical significance perspective because we didn't have any control, right? The Hawthorne effect says if you're given a new tool, uh, you're going to try to use it. So maybe that's why they shared so much more. Um, however, usage continued in the weeks after the study until there was a certain point at which FeedMe stopped working and then of course everybody stopped using it. Um, <laughs> but it's working again, so you can all use it now. Noteworthy also that 95% of the recipients were not using FeedMe. They don't have to be part of the system in order to benefit from receiving. Uh, we surveyed these recipients, many of whom were not users of FeedMe, uh, and they reported on 160 shared posts. 80% of them were, ha had novel content, and in general, they were very appreciative of having received those posts. Here are the, the distribution of ratings of quality of how happy they were to have gotten that post. Um, after the study, we asked our users whether they liked having these recommendations of uh, people to send the content to. And uh, by a two to one ratio, they preferred having recommendations. Um, the people who had them liked the speed, staying in the flow, keyboard free, no cognitive load to figure out who should be receiving the content. Um, the people who disliked them disliked the visual clutter that it introduced in every, uh, in every posting to see this line of, of suggestions. So that could conceivably be fixed with some better UI design. Um, for the overload indicators, a third of the subjects who had them said that they were their favorite feature, knowing how much content your recipient has gotten is very important. Half of the subjects who didn't have them asked for them, uh, even though we didn't tell them they existed. So this is pretty important. Um, their presence, the people who had the overload indicators shared more, but not in a statistically significant fashion. The one-click thanks, we just toss that in for fun, but it turned out to be really important. 30% of the shares got a thank you. And a user observed that the alternative to that one-click thank you was to do nothing at all. Because actually, can you imagine actually writing a thank you email for every post that somebody sends to you? Way too much work and it's almost awkward. Like, come on, they just sent you a post. It wasn't that much work. Is it really deserving of a thank you note? But it's deserving of a thank you click. And so now senders get that positive feedback that it's actually a good idea to send more. So now I can throw up this contrast, right? With these machine filtering methods, you have to read stuff that you might not like in order to get benefit in the future. You're not getting anything out of it now. And you have to deal with all those machine learning mistakes. With FeedMe, the sharer has just read this content. They don't have to read it for the purposes of 
recommendation. They've read it because they wanted to. Now they just click on a button. And they get to feel good because they're sharing right now. Immediate benefit. It's not for the future. Plus, they get this positive feedback from the one-click thanks. So my summary here is that people are the best recommenders. Um, doing it seems hard. There are these barriers. But if we can remove them, we can stimulate more powerful sharing. Um, we're using machine he learning here, but in a subsidiary role. And really, we're letting people do what they do best. Okay. Yes? For the feature called saw it already. Yes. Um, that meant that someone had sent that post to them. Exactly. Post. Main post. That's right. And how often did that? Um, I'd have to go back. I, how often it happened? I'd have to go back and look at the data. I mean, f I, you know, far more commonly relevant was just the count of how many posts they had received on a given day. Right. That that that's meaningless regardless of what the post is. Okay. All right. Last thing for me to race through. Structured data. Um, we all know structured data is valuable. We're computer scientists. Um, it supports rich visualization, sorting, filtering, queries, mergers with other structured data. Um, companies pay lots of money right, to build big, fancy, database-driven websites. Must be useful. You get things like, you know, this is an old Epicurious web page from a previous site design. They use templating, so they don't have to write HTML manually for every recipe. Um, they let people filter on ingredients and seasons and categories and contents. There's a search box. You can sort by price and match quality and all sorts of other good stuff. Um, and you can make really fancy visualizations with maps and things if you have latitudes and longitudes and categories for icons. Regular people, though, well, we're just writing HTML, blogs, forums. Wikis. That is, sorry. <laughs> yes, but Facebook pages are also full of text that regular people are writing. Yes, you're right. But I, I should update this uh, slide. Why is this? Well, professional sites have a rich data model. Uh, the information is in databases. It's extracted using complex queries and fed into these templating web servers. This is great if you have a database engineering team and a web design team and so on and so forth. Plain authors can't operate a database, can't write queries to extract the data can't write templates, they have less power to communicate effectively with the information that they have. One way the world tries to cope with this is with information extraction. I mean, again, the machine learning data mining approach. You spider the content and you extract all of the entities using natural language processing. It's imperfect, so errors creep in. And this is very useful to the company that's doing the spidering, but does not provide any value to the person who actually published the content. They can't manage their data as data. They can't create rich visualizations using it. Another possibility is enforcement. Right? You can require users to record their information as structured data for the benefit of their corporate masters. And I had a great discussion last week with my physical therapist about their new electronic medical record system. She was explaining how frustrated they'd gotten that recording a new patient required 27 mouse clicks until they discovered that if they just put all the information in the comment box, it was much easier. <laughs> OK, so I don't need to tell you what that means. Um, so let's instead thinking about giving people incentives. Uh, give people tools that let them author the structured data and the visualizations themselves. So that, and tell them that the reason you're doing this is not for somebody else's benefit, but so that you can communicate effectively. Um, but as a side effect, let's make all of that data available uh, uh, for combination and reuse with other structured data. So individual incentive leading to social benefit. Do we need this? Well. We looked at 21 blogs. We, went, uh, we picked sort of top blogs from Technorati. Um, we looked at 10 articles from each of those 10 blogs. 18 of the 21 blogs had at least one article with a collection of data items described. Half of them described in text, and half of them as a static HTML table. None of them had any kind of interactive data presentation. So what can we do to fix this? Well, HTML is the language of the web. Let us extend HTML to talk about data. Anyone authoring HTML using any mechanism should be able to author data and interactive visualization at the same time. Edit this data HTML in their web pages, in their blogs, in their wikis, and have rich interactive visualizations come out the other end. Publishing the data is actually pretty easy. We have spreadsheets. We can put those spreadsheets on the web, and we've published our data. 
but it's also very boring because there's no visualization. So what we decided to do was identify the key elements of interactive visualizations, um, the kinds of things that you have in spreadsheet charts, for example, and then just add them as new tags to HTML. Now, we can't magically create new tags in HTML, but we can create a JavaScript library that will understand the new tags. Um, and then configure these new tags by binding them to the underlying data. Uh, this is exactly like you work in creating charts in, in, in a spreadsheet. You select some columns of data, you sp select a chart type, and you say which columns from your data should be used to generate that chart. We want the same metaphor of which columns from my data should be used to generate a particular visualization on the web. Right. So what are these elements on the web? Well, I already showed them to you, right? Templates, sorting, searching, filtering. Um, let's make tags for them, the same way as you make tags for images. Okay. So we're going, r right now we already have an image tag in HTML. Let us also create, um, sorry, I already talked about data. Let's create a view tag that says, for example, I want a view that is a list of items, or I want a view that is a map, or I want a view that is a bar chart. And just like in spreadsheets, we will then bind that view to certain columns of our data collection. So here's an imaginary bit of HTML for saying that, right? Make a view, the type of view is a list, and the sort property is the price column. Put that in your HTML. Another thing we have is facets, right? Which let you filter on the item collection. Well, we can make an HTML tag saying make a facet, and the column that should be used for filtering is the ingredient column. Templates are much the same. For templates, we make some HTML and say, fill in the blank of the template with this column or with this column. Okay. So that was a quick snapshot of what we think are the key, key elements of a data interactive visualization. Templates for single items with fill in the blanks uh, from columns of your data views of the items consisting of lists or thumbnails or maps or scatter plots, and specification of which columns of your data should be used as, say, the latitude, longitude in a map. And then finally, facets for filtering the information based on its structure. To support this, we created a JavaScript library called Exhibit, uh, which uses the vocabulary that I just outlined for you. When you include the exhibit library in your HTML document, you now have a bunch of new tags that you can write in your HTML. Exhibit takes care of loading the data and interpreting the new tags and generating the interactive visualizations that are specified using, uh, using the tags. And with Exhibit, you can create an interactive web visualization just from two static files, your HTML file with its data, description, with its data visualization descriptions, and your data file, which can be a spreadsheet or a CSV or an XML file uh, stuck on your, on your website. There's nothing that you install or configure. All of this runs in the visitor's browser. Um, this tool has been around for several years. There are about 1,800 sites using it now to make exhibits um, and a reasonably large user community. Um, Here are, oh, that's sorry, I was printing the wrong thing. Here is a quick walk through a bunch of different visualizations of things that you can find on the web uh, using Exhibit. Uh, faculty page collections, uh, scatter plots, uh, publications. Any of you who has publications, you should consider using Exhibit to show off your publications collection. Uh, the history of classical music, breweries and distilleries in Ontario from 1914 to 1915, um, all the Broadway shows Gina, Gina Trapani's ever seen, um, all the FIFA World Cup winners, um, all the interview subjects and language acquisition from somebody's PhD thesis, um, some weird thing involving brains, <laughs> court cases at the European Court for Human Rights, um, uh, uh, drug, drug, in, drug options uh, for, for people suffering from various uh, conditions. Um, ozone concentrations throughout the United States uh, nitri uh, and in Spain. Uh, the Columbia Law Library's collections of artifacts that you, uh, of resources. Um, reports. 
Uh, if you want to buy an ocarina, okay, you can go to ocarinacatalog.com and uh, all of these are created just using, just as an HTML file by introducing these tags that say, make me a thumbnail visualization, put this facet on this property and this facet on this property. You're just writing HTML tags. Newspapers are using it to show uh, unsafe bridges in Minnesota. Don't go to Minnesota. The, this, is, the, the, this is a very scary map if you look at it. Um, the St. Petersburg Times wanted to report on people who were double dipping on their retirement, pen on their pensions and drawing salaries at the same time. Um, ah, this one hits close to home. Foreclosures in the Bay Area. Okay. Um, this one's interesting to me because it's just a map. In theory, you're supposed to use Google Maps to make just a map. But to use Google Maps, you have to write JavaScript and program in an API and so on and so forth, right? But here you just put in a tag saying, make a map on the following data, and the map gets made for you. Um, all right, so that's Exhibit. And uh, I keep these snapshots around in case the web is down. All right, its scaling is limited. This is for small data, 1,000 items, no more. It works for bigger sets, but gets slow. Uh, the Library of Congress has paid us to make a faster one for bigger data sets, uh, but it's not done yet. Um, Jeff Hare's Datavore may solve all our problems. We're hoping to put it in as a back end in order to uh, speed up the performance of the system. Interesting side effects. Once somebody writes one of these pages, because the data is explicitly stated, um, we provide you with a data copy button. So you can take that data and do something else with it. Right? Now, if you walk up to somebody and say, hey, we want you to publish structured data so that other people can take your data and do something else with it, that's not a really good incentive. But if we tell people, hey, we want, you to, we want to give you the opportunity to make a beautiful data visualization and, um, you will, uh, and, and have this export as a side effect, that's a big win. Um, so now anyone who can write HTML can write a data interactive web page with all of these uh, nice features that we expect on professional websites. You post it on the web and it works. Visualization is the incentive. So I had a bit more to say, but I'm going to wrap up here. Um, we've incorporated this into wikis and blogs so that people don't have to author the HTML themselves but can use the WYSIWYG tools. Um, but the conclusion that I began with, since I knew people would be leaving at this point, um, is that people can be their own powerful information managers. They can capture information scraps and discuss lecture notes and recommend content and author structured data. In each case, the key is to consider what people are able to do and not build tools that prevent them from doing it. Okay. Um, and give them the incentives uh, so that they want to do it. Um, with Listit, the incentive is to capture more information and removing these deterrents of too much, too much effort to capture it. With NB, the incentive is to keep people in the, con in the flow of reading their lecture notes. Don't interrupt and go off to a different forum to do it. Just mark up the comments, your comments in the sides and see what other people are doing. With FeedMe, the incentive is, let's cut down, our, or the deterrent is too much work to share and too much fear of sharing. So let's remove those deterrents and replace it with incentives in the form of explicit thank yous uh, from the people who are receiving the content. With Exhibit, the deterrents are the, con con the complexity of structured data management tools. Let's get rid of those deterrents and replace it with the incentive of being able to communicate with rich data visualizations just by writing a web page without having to program anything. Um, here are all of my collaborators who um, are to be thanked for actually you know, creating all of this wonderful stuff. And if you want to try it all, each one of these tools is available. And as I said in the middle, I would love for you to try them, get your feedback on them, talk about other research that we can do uh, with them. Uh, I, I look forward to hearing from you. Thanks very much. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.